On this edition of Geopolitics and Empire, we are once again interviewing strategic risk consultant and best-selling author F. William Engdahl. He's been on with us many times before. We'll be talking about his take on what's happening with the coronavirus or COVID-19, or as I like to call it, COVID-1984. Uh, and we'll be looking at why many governments are responding uh, the way that they are responding by locking down their citizens. And we'll also touch on the economy and what may be the greatest financial crash the world has ever seen. Uh, William, there are, a lot, there are a lot of views on COVID-19. Um, I've interviewed Francis Boyle, who considers it uh, a bioweapon. Our interview was recently deleted from YouTube. So again, we, we ask listeners to go subscribe to our email list and all of our, our alternative uh, channels. But you have been writing about this, uh, William, and you talk about this Rockefeller report from 2010 that eerily lays out this exact scenario that we're uh, experiencing. So could you give us your thoughts uh, on what's going on right now in the world? Uh, if I had to predict that the world would be doing what it's doing and governments around the world without a nary a peep of protest from uh, the broader population, uh, I could not have imagined it in my worst uh, case scenarios for, for world geopolitics. The, if you step back a minute from, from what began dominating the news back in late January out of Wuhan, China with the novel coronavirus, as they called it, and look at where we are today. We are full steam ahead with the implementation of uh, the Rockefeller globalist uh, endgame called uh, Agenda 2030. And part of this, this is uh, the propaganda campaign of young Greta over the last months uh, from Sweden, uh, not to take airplanes because of their carbon footprint, not to drive cars because of their carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. You know, no one could imagine how the world would peacefully accept that. Uh, you know, they left it, uh, the idea even. And yet, one year later, here we are, nobody is, almost anybody is able to fly anywhere with very few exceptions. The price of air travel has become sky high. I have a nephew in, in uh, the U.S. who had to fly with his young family to Europe, and he had an economy ticket purchased you know, before Christmas, and he needed to change that to fly earlier because of the lockdowns of the coronavirus, COVID-19, or 1984, as you call it. And the airline, the European airline that he had booked on said, well, we can give you a seat uh, on that date, but uh, an economy plus seat will cost you three thousand three hundred dollars. You know, th this is the kind of world that we're going to, I fear, with this this whole uh, Corona precedent. Now, if this is a test run or not, the scenarios have been out there. You mentioned the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, in two thousand ten, they published something called a totally bland title scenarios for the future of technology and international development. It was published in cooperation with Peter Schwartz, a uh, futurologist, a very controversial futurologist uh, in his global business network. And in there, they have, they have a scenario, uh, 2010 this is now, keep in mind, Rockefeller Foundation published that. Uh, it was uh, obviously not meant for popular consumption, but just uh, to circulate among certain circles. So the scenario, I'll just give you a quote from it. In 2012, the pandemic the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, the so-called swine flu, which amounted to almost nothing, this new influenza strain originating from wild geese was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population, killing 8 million in seven months, had a deadly effect on economies. International mobility of people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains. Even locally, normally bustling shops and office buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. This is 2010, and then 
uh, I think I, uh, it's very useful to combine this with uh, something that the Bill Gates Foundation, together with the World Economic Forum Davos, sponsored as a fictional scenario simulation in October of 2019. They called it, why I don't know, but they called it Event 201. And I'll quote from what's on their website about what the Event 201 was. It simulated, and quote, outbreak of a novel zoonotic coronavirus transmitted from bats to pigs to people eventually becomes efficiently transmissible from person to person, leading to severe pandemic. The pathogen and the disease it causes are modeled largely on SARS, S-A-R-S, severe uh, uh, respiratory syndrome, uh, acute respiratory syndrome, but it is more transmissible in the community setting by people with mild symptoms. Quote, this is from Bill Gates Foundation Event 201 simulation, fictional simulation. And part of the game was to have leading figures in global public health to give their response. Now, who were the players? This was done in New York City in a closed door uh, simulation in October of 2019 just weeks before the apparent first case of, of the Wuhan novel coronavirus was, was uh, detected. And what's interesting is one of the selected people invited to this Gates Foundation simulation was a gentleman by the name of George F. Gao. George F. Gao, otherwise known as Professor Gao, is today and was then the director of the Chinese Center for Disease Control. And this is interesting. He specializes in influenza virus interspecies transmission, i.e. host jump. And his interests include virus ecology, especially relationship between influenza virus, like the coronavirus, and migratory birds or live poultry markets and the bat-derived virus ecology and molecular biology. Bat-derived virus ecology. Uh, another invited guest at this Bill Gates uh, simulation, Event 201, last October, was uh, a woman by the name of Avril Hines. Now, Avril Hines served as the first woman deputy director of something called the Central Intelligence Agency, then she became Barack Obama's assistant to the president and principal deputy national security advisor. Another player in the Gates uh, simulation was Rear Admiral Stephen Redd, who had something called the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response at the CDC in Atlanta, the Center for Disease Control. This is the outfit that is in, in the middle of this huge scandal for sending out defective uh, coronavirus tests uh, across the nation and, and still not uh, having an adequate response for these tests. So uh, and he's the director of preparedness at the CDC and was involved in a simulation of a global pandemic back in October. So uh, that's Quite interesting. There are also other people, uh, Vice President of Johnson & Johnson, a huge uh, pharmaceutical medical company that has many scandals uh, in recent months. And uh, another person is a head of crisis and emergency continuity management for Lufthansa, one of the leading airlines in the world that has had huge cancellation of flights worldwide. So, w William, it seems like in the media that this whole situation has been framed between like some kind of war between U.S. and China. But as, as you've mentioned, it seems there's, there's a lot of cooperation going on at the international level with people from U.S. and China and the pharmaceutical companies and the international institutions. And yes. as you said, um, you've been writing about this for, for decades, this, this push towards this global system. And just like you, I mean, even I couldn't have, I, I've been expecting this to arrive at some point in the future, but I mean, I nearly fell off my chair. I can't believe it's come uh, so fast, this global kind of dystopian scenario, as I like to call it. And, yeah. And you're right. I mean, the travel's locked down. You know, I fear for 
even for my future, because I literally cannot leave, leave the country where I'm located. I was, in fact, supposed to be on a flight on the, on the weekend. And, and as well as today, the time of this recording, I was supposed to be on another flight traveling. And it's all just been been lost. And so w- what's the game here? I mean, why now? W- w- where are we going? Um, where are they taking us with with all of this? Well, I think if we step back a little bit, uh, not too far, and go back to last summer when the head of the Bank of England gave a speech where he predicted the end of the dollar currency reserve system among central banks in world economy and talked about the inauguration of a cashless society, digital cash, using perhaps uh, not Bitcoin, but but the uh, cryptocurrency, uh, digital currencies for central banks. And Mark Carney was his name. He's now a key advisor on global warming to Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Now you have the head of WHO warning against using paper money because of all things, it's supposed to be a a very easy way to transmit coronavirus uh, from person to person by handling that paper money. So in, in, in effect, it's giving the central bankers an excuse to do something they never would have gotten away with uh, by popular opinion even a year ago, that is to ban uh, paper money. So now you'll have central banks controlling every penny we spend, every move that we make. Uh, you have already Facebook and Google and, and the, uh, you know, the alphabet soup uh, controlling our motions through our, our smartphones and everything else, computers. So, we're coming to, as you put it, the dystopian uh, horror of, of a globally controlled economy, uh, very similar to many things that already exist in China that have shocked uh, much of the world in recent months. What's happening now in the U.S., we're talking about a 1929 Great Depression or, or, or something worse, and then there's people who think that Trump will be able to to stop it or, or, or save it if he calls off the, the current lockdown, you know, in, in a week or two. Uh, but I think a lot of people, and there's people who think the U.S. dollar is going to increase uh, in value as there's a dollar shortage and that the U.S. dollar is going to run on for a, a good while and that America will rise in a sense because of this. But then there's other people who think America is going to completely crash. So uh, where do you see the economy going? I'd go at it from a different uh, angle, and that is, what do the globalists like Zbigniew Brzezinski or David Rockefeller, uh, who are uh, rotting in hell, I would guess at this point, what what was their agenda? And that was to end the nation state. Well, one of the key nation states that has to be utterly destroyed as a functioning entity is the United States of America. And there's been a process ever since the Kennedy assassination to do that by something that uh, occasionally or sometimes is called the deep state or the invisible government or the uh, CIA and uh, various secret societies or networks and to destroy the nation state so that uh, the globalists can create this, this global control and impose an agenda Keep in mind that these are people who have advocated for more than a hundred years a massive reduction of global population under under the banner of eugenics, and now it's been pushed under the banner of uh, CO2 control. You know, control the carbon footprint, get rid of human beings as much as possible. And some people advocate a population globally of less than one billion people. So. You know, that's probably going to take a while, but uh, there are certainly signs that we're at this point, the coronavirus did not cause the meltdown of of the largest financial bubble in human history that built up after the 2008 financial crisis by central banks uh, just printing money with abandon. The bubble always market crashes, the Great Depression, the 1929 stock market crash on Wall Street, etc., Every time there's such a crash, it's always done by the central banks. It's never just kind of an accident. And that I detail in in some depth in in my book, The Gods of Money, Wall Street and the 
death of the American century. Some people call it the all everything bubble that we've had in the last 10 years was over overripe for a crash. The only thing that kept it going was repeated infusions of money from the Federal Reserve and, and uh, uh, ultra low interest rates so that corporations like Boeing could borrow and use that money to buy their stocks back and pump up the stock value so that the CEO and board members could uh, you know, make obscene profits, but uh, there wouldn't be any real investment in, in uh, you know, in manufacturing technology or anything else. So this thing has been ready to, to blow for, uh, as I see it, several years now, and it needed only a trigger. Well, the plausible trigger came along and it, it was called the novel coronavirus or Wuhan virus, or if you want, the COVID-19. And that gave the central banks the excuse to avoid being blamed for the collapse that's underway right now. I see nothing that indicates anything that's been proposed by the Trump administration is going to reverse this, quite the opposite. Uh, the measures being advocated are, are uh, laughable in terms of effect. We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of meltdown of, of paper assets on the stock markets and bond markets and so forth. Add to that the fact that Saudi Arabia initiated an oil war against the American shale producers at a time the shale industry in the U.S. was uh, coming into dire straits already. And uh, we have the collapse of, of world oil markets. That's not going to be a plus for world economic growth by any means. It's going to be a negative because uh, a trillion dollar industry in the United States is, is going to go into a domino style series of bankruptcies and the production shutdowns, job losses, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs in Texas and uh, uh, North Dakota and other states across the U.S. on the shale industry. That's not to defend uh, shale oil as, as a healthy thing for the environment, far from it. But uh, uh, in terms of its economic effect, it's going to be horrendous. So we have all of this coming together in a perfect, not even a storm, a, a perfect hurricane of events that are ravaging the world economy. This is, even if the lockdowns were to end, you know, day after tomorrow or one week from tomorrow, the momentum being built up every day and the sell-off of, of assets uh, and the margin calls on, on hedge funds and others, uh, is is such that it's it's going to it's already creating a 1929 style of of uh, collapse of assets globally. So there are measures that could be taken. Uh, there are alternative solutions. One that's been mentioned recently is by an American economist, Michael Hudson, for a national debt jubilee, where where the government uh, forgives, you know, huge amounts of debt, like like the uh, student loan debts and so forth, uh, and allows, in effect, putting the U.S. economy through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization kind of, of process, freeze all the assets and uh, decide what critical manufacturing and industrial functions are necessary to keep jobs and and, and economic functioning uh, going and get rid of all the fictitious uh, or, or inflated asset values like the stock market bubble and so forth that uh, are not used to the good of the real economy. But I don't, I don't see that anything even close to that. You would have to, of course, nationalize the Federal Reserve, which uh, never should have been privatized in 1913 as it was by the J.P. Morgan Rockefeller interest in, in a coup d'etat over over the U.S. Constitution using Woodrow Wilson as their front man signing the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, you would have to renationalize control over, over the, the U.S. dollar emission and put it in the hands of, of the government as the Constitution mandated. And you could begin restoring uh, the economy in, in ways that go against the money interests. 
but the money interests uh, have a little bit of influence over the mainstream media, over television, over you know opinion making, over uh, social media, which which they control through three or four obscenely large corporations that are now in the business of privately deciding what media content is allowed and what media content is censored, as you just mentioned uh, with YouTube. So the situation we're facing, I think, is is dire and everybody's distracted by the fear over coronavirus. It's a little bit like the uh, Patriot Act passage and the fear over 9-11, you know, that uh, some uh, uh, Arab or Saudi fanatic sitting in a cave in Afghanistan was going to direct, uh, uh, redirect airplanes to blow up the United States of America and, and uh, destroy everything. And therefore, we allow the Patriot Act to be passed with nary a, a no vote in the Congress out of fear. And now we're doing similar things, but far, far worse under this uh, novel coronavirus panic. Do you think that they would necessitate, you know, that uh, a third world war, perhaps, like but with China? I mean, so the economy is crashing. They're, they're in, uh, installing all these laws, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. They're, they're putting in all these kinds of more authoritarian laws that will remain there once this coronavirus passes. But do you think we'll see mil uh, large scale military conflict in the near future with China? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think the, the powers that be find it will be necessary to get what they want. I don't, I don't, uh, I think this is a war being waged by mind control more than anything. Are, are there any other things that, thoughts that you have that you'd like to mention? Because, and, and to give us kind of a vision of, of the future, because you mentioned some of the things we're already beginning to see, a cashless a digital uh, system, uh, the, all our media and internet controlled will probably have this reputation score like that they have in China where, you know, where some of us are, are already starting to have um, content deleted and perhaps soon accounts will be deleted, uh, travel being restricted, living costs going up, supply chains uh, broken, so our access to goods being limited, and now all around the world in many countries, uh, authoritarian laws being passed, and so it's it's really quite frightening and so any other thoughts you have or or um how do you how do you see the the near or distant future i think the most important thing is for people to keep a perspective on what's going on not to panic legitimate health concerns are not to be made light of whatever is going on that's causing deaths of elderly people in italy and northern italy especially and elsewhere in the world the difficulty there is that we don't have enough information to say for certain what is the cause of death of all these people. And even the tests for positive coronavirus presence are highly flawed, let's say. And therefore, I've, I've read reports that in many emergency room situations in northern Italy where so many people are dying, that uh, they're just anyone who dies with anything having to do with the lung is automatically labeled coronavirus. And yet uh, one study by a government institute in Rome looked at, looked at the case histories of several hundred of those who died and found their average age was above age 79, uh, that almost all of them had prior severe illnesses such as heart problems, diabetes, or or uh severe lung problems from smoking or air pollution in northern italy uh, one of the worst air pollution areas in the european union by the way uh, or just what it was uh, but uh, that that's all being labeled in, in the chaos that exists right now that's all being labeled as as coronavirus and that of course spreads the panic by the day and then you have the world health organization which is uh, uh, an organization that uh, I think should be shut down immediately before it spreads any more damage. And the director of WHO, Tedros Adnan, from Ethiopia, comes from a political party that's committed genocide against larger tribes in Ethiopia when he was foreign minister and or before that health minister. 
who owes his job most likely to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the uh, Clinton Foundation back some years ago when he was uh, minister in Ethiopia. And he issues statements that do nothing but spread panic, statements about uh, you know the percentage of people that will die from this, which are uh, according to serious uh, statistical analysts, analysts uh, in the health domain are completely fraudulently being uh, devised by you know completely nonsensical uh, measurements. But you know that has the effect of spreading panic, so governments can turn to this. Another effect you have is, is that uh, with lockdown, you can't have a demonstration of more than two people. <laughs> you know, uh, people aren't allowed to assemble. The, the yellow vests in France are, are gone, vanished. They're behind closed doors now. Uh, the same in Hong Kong, the same all around the world. Uh, this is unprecedented, I would say. I as to what, how this might might uh, further e evolve, I just, I, it's beyond me. I don't see a positive light at the end of the tunnel, other than the oncoming uh, high-speed locomotive that's heading toward us, the human race. I mean, if we're insane enough to, to allow the world economy to shut down completely because of uh, a few thousand deaths of a of, uh, virus who's been defined by government authorities in a country who has a rather poor record of health safety, China, uh, in the past, and by politicians in WHO and elsewhere who uh, have a record in the Gates Foundation uh, as well, have a record of introducing vaccines into Africa for polio and other things in India that have resulted, the vaccines themselves have been attributed to causing polio-like illnesses and, and uh, even deaths in, in many of those developing countries. So these are the people now who are uh, more or less running the key decisions. And that's, that's a pretty alarming thought. Are there, is there any other thought, a final thought for us? I mean, I, I kind of agree with you. I don't see anything positive and all we can do is you know go about our lives um fight well, we, can't, we can't even do that well yeah you're <laughs> right <laughs> but I, I i mean we can fight against this thing but it just seems uh, as many most of the people are buying are, are have some kind of stockholm syndrome and you, you try to point these things out to them and they, they just uh, go with whatever the authorities are saying and they just look at things they think things are going to go back to, to normal uh, or they rationalize all of all of the things that are all of these things that are being being put into place and so yeah yeah well now you know here i here i sit in a, a modern european country that um, used to have the strongest economy in europe germany and children are not only not allowed to go to school because of fear that the little ones will be the carriers without symptom, asymptomatic carriers of the virus to the elderly. You know, when the children, grandchildren come to visit grandma and grandpa, that they'll uh, unknowingly infect grandma and grandpa, and that'll cause more corona to spread and so on. So now there's a lockdown of schools, of kindergartens, and then a couple of days later, well, what are young children going to do? They need to get outside. It's springtime is coming, and they, they need to have physical exercise and so on. The second step was to close all public playgrounds. So children can't even go out and, and play in the fresh air and get some sun and, and, you know, have healthy exercise moving around. So they have to sit home with electronic games or Lord knows what for endless hours or go crazy and uh, drive their parents crazy. The parents have to uh, take leave from their jobs, if their jobs even exist after all this take leave and, and uh, take care of their children at home. So it's causing a chain reaction shutdown of, of entire economies in, in a way that most people haven't even realized how, I think most people hope that this is going to be done in two to three weeks, maybe a month at the most, and then we can slowly get back to normal. And so, well, let's see how it looks in two to three weeks. But if we're not... Uh, uh, seeing governments begin to 
loosen up in, in, in that regard, then I think we're uh, required to rethink everything that's been going on and everything that we're being told. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have for listeners uh, a more positive note. I feel the same way uh, as you. And it's kind of like uh, things have gone 180 when we speak about your body of work, warning about this full spectrum dominance um, and many of these issues, you know, this this new, wor new world order, totalitarian democracy. And it seems like where they they are going to achieve or they're on their w well on their way to achieve this full spectrum dominance on a global scale and right now we don't really have a a bright light um and so i i think a divine intervention of some sort is required to to bring the world back to some kind of sanity or in the direction of some kind of sanity because the the government reactions that have been put in place so far are so disproportionate to the, well, often the comparison is made with seasonal flu number of deaths. And uh, we're talking about uh, what, 4,000, 5,000, maybe 6,000 dead worldwide from the novel coronavirus, so-called, or COVID-19. And compare that with uh, 300,000 or maybe more of, of deaths from uh, seasonal flu pneumonia related uh, illnesses annually and it just you know it just doesn't add up all right um if there's if there's nothing else um how can people best uh support you i know you're at will williamengdahl.com uh people can still purchase your many books uh you're on twitter yeah best is to go on the website and and uh, just uh, surf around explore around a little bit and you'll find everything there links to my books and so I don't know how this is, is going to develop, but uh, I, I can say that it's beyond anything I've experienced in my lifetime, and I'm sure yours. And, uh, well, <laughs> I hopefully the reaction so far in Russia is not because of an absence of the coronavirus, but because of uh, a knowledge that uh, uh, the measures being put in place in the West and in China are not conducive to minimizing the deaths of whatever is going on well we'll, we'll we will all continue fighting the good fight um hopefully some gandalf comes along but we shouldn't rest on our laurels uh and we should keep uh, investigating and fighting against this authoritarianism that's coming at us from every which way uh we wish you well william uh out there thank you. in europe and so thank you again I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platforms such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.